guests, uh, Pastors Tracy and Asia. Welcome to be with us. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, their son Brian was seen today a couple weeks ago. Their other son David was up here on the drums, and they've been a blessing to us. And so we, we welcome you. Amen. Um, all right. I want to finish up this series, and it's entitled, You Get It All. You're going to love this message. Poke your neighbor and say, you get it all. Some of you didn't act like you wanted it all. I'm getting it all. Poke your neighbor and say, you get it all. All right, let's have some fun with this. Poke your neighbor and say, you get it all. That's kind of like Holly. She get all of this. Guess what? You get it all from Jesus. Somebody shout amen. All right. Let's, uh, we're going to read from Ruth chapter 4, verse 1 through 20. Now, Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. Boaz said, come aside, friend, sit down here. And he came aside and sat down, and he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Oh, I know what it was. Connecting point. <laughs> July 9th, 16th, and 23rd, we're going to do connecting point. And if you've not been through connecting point, you're going to want to sign up for that. Amen. Poke your neighbor and say, sign up for connecting point. That's totally not how you're supposed to do it, but we went there. Amen. All right, verse 3. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. He said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, on the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabite, the Moabite, excuse me, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem the right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Verse 7, now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm anything. One man took off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal. And Boaz said to the elders of all and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilean's and Malon's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. Verse 11. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make this the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah. This is an incredible verse of scripture here on the power of blessing. And we're going to get into this. The two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper another blessing in Ephratah and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house, a third part of the blessing, be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this woman, young woman. Verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. I love it. Ten years, Malon could not provide a child, but when she got united with the right person, she conceived immediately. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative. And may his name be famous in Israel. May he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, is, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom, became a nurse to him. And the neighbor woman gave him a name saying, there is a son born to Naomi, and they call his name, called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. So Ruth and Boaz are the great-grandparents of King David. 
Now this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begat Hezron, Hezron begat Ram, Ram begat Abinadab, and Abinadab begat Nashon, and Nashon begat Salmon, Salmon begat Boaz, Boaz begat Obed, Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begot David. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for your presence. I thank you, Father God, for getting a hold of our hearts here today. For the next few moments, may you arrest our attention. God, I pray let this seed fall in the good soul of our hearts and go and bear forth fruit in our lives. God, let not one word come out of my mouth, but every word straight from the throne of God into our hearts. And God, I pray, Lord, let my preaching today be not in word and tongue only, but also in power and in deed. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hold your Bibles up and let's boldly declare, Father, today, this week, by your grace, I'm going to be a doer of your word and not a hearer only, deceiving my own self. Now, Lord, anoint my ears, anoint my heart, anoint my spirit, my soul, my mind, and my body to receive the truth of your word. In Christ's name I pray. Amen, amen. High five two or three people and say you get it all. You know, when this story started... They had moved from Bethlehem, they went to Moab, the cursed land, things didn't go well. All the men died, Naomi heads back, Ruth, Orpah goes one way, Ruth goes whether your people are going to be my people, your God, my God. By chapter 2, verse 1, she says, I'm going out to the corners of the field, and she does, she starts reaping, Boaz takes notice of her, sets her at the table, gives her ten times as much. She goes home. Naomi says, hey, he's the next of kin. Here's what you're going to do. Go down to his bedchamber. Go down to where you can get to his feet and really get intimate with Boaz. Now, there's nothing sexual is going on at this point, but it was a sign of like a marriage proposal, very intimate. He sends her home. He lays it on her. We preached that last week, 20 times as much as the corner of the fields. And that leads us to where she pr uh, proposes marriage to him. He says, hey, I'm going to check on this. I'm going to do this tomorrow. Actually, it was at midnight. She said, later today, I'm going to deal with this. But there is somebody closer than you. So he goes to the city gate, and he finds a fellow with ten witnesses, and he says, hey. He said, Naomi's back in town in case you hadn't noticed, and uh, she needs her property redeemed. You going to buy it? And the guy says, sure, I'll buy her property. He says, oh, but I need you to know that when you do that, you're also going to be buying back Ruth, and you're going to have to raise up a seed for her dead husband. He says, well, I can't do that. I'm going to ruin my own inheritance, so you redeem her. So that picks us up into the first point, and that is get God in your shoes. Poke your neighbor and say, get God in your shoes. Watch this in Ruth chapter 4, verse 7 through 8. Here's where we pick up. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm anything. One man took off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal. It was like a transaction. You buy my piece of property, here's my sandal. Now, you, you, you take that. That was a, like a signed contract back then. I know it was a little weird and different, but that's the way they did business back then. But there's something significant about sandals being taken off in the Bible, and you and I need to hear what it is because it greatly affects us today. There's some powerful, powerful examples. Let's begin in Exodus 3, 1 through 5. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the backside of the desert, came to Horeb, the mountain of God, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. I love it. The bush is on fire with no bugs, but the bush ain't getting consumed. I love it. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet. Everybody shout, Take your sandals off. Take your sandals off. For the place where you are standing is holy ground. So God said, Listen, the place where you're standing is holy ground, Moses, and I need you to get your shoes off. And we look at that, and we see 
the sanctuary or the auditorium here. It's a place of holiness. It's a place where God's presence is. And in the Old Testament, really, we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Everywhere we go, we take holiness with us, or at least we're supposed to. But what I believe that God was really telling Moses was, listen, Moses, I got a job for you to do, and it's too big for you. God was saying, Moses, here's what I need you to do. I don't really need you to do much. I just need to get your shoes off you, and I need to get in your shoes. Because what I got you to do is so much bigger than you. There's so much to do. There's a Pharaoh and his army that is greater than you. There are problems you're going to face that you can't handle. By the way, you're going to have one million whiners that you're going to have to deal with every day of your life. All you're going to hear for 40 years is how much better they had it back in Egypt. They don't really want to worship God out in the desert. And you're going to have Pharaoh and his army coming after you, and they're big and bad enough to kill you. And you're going to have everybody against you. At times, your own brother, Aaron, he's going to make a golden calf. And listen, Moses, I just ain't going to tell you at all because it'd blow your mind you'd quit before you started. Moses is hearing this from God, and he starts stuttering. I can't even talk right. God says, don't worry, I'll talk through you. I can't, I can't, I can't. Don't worry, I'll send you a brother. Finally, God says, listen, here's all I need you to do. I just need you to get your shoes off. Because when you get your shoes off and you quit walking the way you want to walk, going where you want to go, doing it how you think is best in your own power and your own strength, I'll get them shoes and guess what? Pharaoh's no match for me. That army that wants to destroy you, he got nothing on me. Don't worry about no water. I'll provide water for two million in the middle of a desert, and you'll have so much water you'll drink till you're filled. Don't worry about food. I'm going to rain down angels' food. You're not hearing what I'm saying today. He said, if you'll just let me get in your shoes, I'll take care of you. Somebody need to hear this today. Because some of you got some doctor's reports, and you're trying to figure out, how am I going to do this? And God is just saying, I just need you to get in, out of your shoes and let me get in them. Because when I get in your shoes, cancer leaves. Diabetes leaves. Heart condition leaves. I don't care what the doctor prognosis is. I am bigger than that. And when you get your shoes off, he says, listen, I know you got a financial issue you're dealing with now. I know you got a problem on your hands, and you're trying to rack your brains of how you're going to fix your financial problem. And God is saying to you and I today, I just need you to get your shoes off and let me get in your shoes. Because when I get in your shoes, I'll provide every dime you need. I'll provide everything you're in need of. I'll provide a home. I'll provide a vehicle. I'll pay the water bill. I'll pay the utility bill. I'll put groceries on the table. My God Somebody need to hear what I'm saying today. You need to get God in your shoes. Woo! Somebody shout to your neighbor, get God in your shoes. God said, listen, Moses, the only thing I really need from you is for you to obey me. I'm going to get in your shoes, and I'm going to walk you down to Egypt. I'm going to walk with you in Pharaoh's court. I'm going to walk with you and show you mighty things through ten plagues. I'm going to, listen, I don't need you to split a Red Sea. Just hold your rod out and do what I tell you. When I'm in your shoes, I'll cause the Red Sea to split. And somebody need to hear me. There's some obstacles in here with somebody. I think it's you, Pastor. And I want to tell you, when God gets in your shoes, the wall that you're facing, is going to split wide open and you're going to walk through like there's nothing. It's going to be dry land. There's not going to be an issue. You won't have to solve it, fix it, or conjure up some answer. God says when I get in your shoes, it's already done. We need to get God in our shoes. I'm going to preach a while. We need to get God in our shoes. At times, we are attempting to accomplish things and do things for God or even in our own lives that are bigger than we are. Look, things that are bigger than our ability, bigger than our budget, bigger than our faith. When we let God take over the situation and get in our shoes, we are declaring the walls are bigger than I am able to scale. The enemy is stronger than me. 
But when God is in my shoes and he is with me, no devil in hell can stop God's plan for my life. So the question is this, is God in your shoes? Have you let him take over the situation you're facing? Are you still trying to fight the battle with your feet in your shoes and not letting God get in there and deal with it? David defeated Goliath, and the Bible records he never lost the battle. But in 17, 1 Samuel 17, 47, it said, Then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hands. Listen, what David understood as a young boy, he understood his whole life. I just need God in my shoes. The battle's not mine. It's the Lord's. You can't deliver folks from Egypt until God is in your shoes. You need to hear what I'm saying. You cannot fulfill the calling of God on your life until God is in your shoes. You will never receive the full cup of overflowing in your life until God is in your shoes. You will never receive abundance until God is in your shoes. But when you get God in your shoes and you walk where he's walking and you stay in step where God is stepping, then you better expect blessing and healing and deliverance and fruitfulness and breakthrough and walls falling down. Get God in your shoes. It gets gooder and gooder. I know you like that South Georgian language right there now. Pokey never says it's going to get gooder and gooder. Joshua 5, 13 and 15. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand, and Joshua went to him and said, stop right there. Every other person in the Old Testament, when they see an angel, they cry, we're going to die, we're going to die. I don't tell you, Joshua's a bad dude. Joshua sees, if you study this, I don't have time to prove it, but it's basically Jesus incarnate with a sword in his hand. And he just walks on over. Hey, you on our side or the other side? Which side is it, boy? I mean, he ain't scared of nothing. And I love what Jesus says. No. Like, I asked you, were you on my side or the other side? Jesus just says, no. <laughs> but as commander of the army of the Lord, I've now come to take over. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worship and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, watch this now, very interesting. Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy, and Joshua did so. So watch this, 40 years later, God is telling Joshua the same thing to Moses. He says, take your shoe off, but he doesn't say shoes this time. He says, shoe, I'm going somewhere. Again, he says, the ground is holy, but as captain of the host, Jesus in the Old Testament showing up, basically, was to bring the... I see flashing. What is going on? Oh, taking pictures. Okay. Jesus, I thought maybe she's trying to get my attention. What is going on here? What he's saying is, Jesus said, I need you to take your shoe off because I've showed up in town to knock down the walls of Jericho because you can't get these walls down on your own. You're not big enough, strong enough, or whatever, but don't worry. When I get in your shoe, all you got to do is obey what I tell you to do. Goofy instructions. Just march around seven days. On the seventh day, march around seven times. And when you get done marching, I'll take them walls and they'll fall down flat. Every wall that you are facing in your personal life will fall down flat as soon as you get God in your shoe. Somebody say amen. Now, you got to understand, what's the difference between shoes and shoe? It was a custom in Israel when a man gave up a piece of property, you need to hear this, that he would take off his shoe at the gate before the elders and give it as a sign to the one who bought that property, watch this, that that person who received the shoe, well, you need to hear this, had the only legal right to possess that property. A transfer of the shoe symbolized a transfer of the property. The changing of the shoes meant, Joshua, you have now given me 
your shoe as God. God is speaking here. He's saying, Joshua, you will now have a right to walk where you haven't walked. <laughs> you will now have legal authority to step in territory you couldn't before. You can now possess what you couldn't possess before. So I stand before you as pastor of Bridge of Hope Church here at 2680 Roosevelt Avenue, and I say, Lord, here's the shoe to this street. Here's the shoe to this church. Here's the shoe to this neighborhood. Here's the shoe to this city. Lord, and now yours. And let me tell you what Jesus says. He says, when I got in your shoe, I now take my authority, and I take what belongs to me, and I now give it back to you only with my power and my blessing and my hand. Now he's saying, Bridge of Hope Church, will you walk where I walk? Will you step where I step? Will you stay where I stay? Will you do what I I do if you will you will possess what you normally didn't possess you will walk where you normally didn't walk you will see life transform where you normally wouldn't give God your shoe you know what God was saying you know what he's saying to Joshua he was saying Joshua I'm about to give you this land I'm about to redeem Canaan, which I gave to Abraham 400 years ago, back to the children of Israel. Give me your shoe, and I will give you authority to walk through the land and claim it for your people. Every giant will bow. Every Ittite and Ite will fall down. You will be victorious. God didn't do this. Watch this. Notice God didn't do the changing of the shoe just before they crossed the Jordan River. He did the changing of the shoe just before they took possession of their first piece of property. Why? Because crossing your Jordan is one thing, but possessing your promise is another. You need to hear what I'm saying. There are some under the sound of my voice by faith, you have stepped through the Jordan River, and you have made it to the promised land. And God is saying, I just need you to give me your shoe, and I'm going to release your healing. I need you to give me your shoe, and I'm going to let you take back your finances. I'm going to let you take back your children, Fex. I'm going to let you take back every promise I've given you. You and your whole household will be saved. Here's a shoe. You want your son shaved? Give your shoe. My God, somebody need to hear this. Somebody needs to start getting your shoes off in this house. God is saying, you got some promises? Are you believing God for something? Then you need to take your shoe off and you need to give it to God. Because when you give God your shoe, it gives him the legal right and authority to turn around and bless you and gives you the authority to walk where you've never walked, to possess what you've never possessed, to see your children saved, to see your healing flow. My blessed Lord, somebody in this house, you need to give God your shoe. I wasn't kidding. I said, God said, you want some? Take your shoes off. So far, I'm the only one that's taking my shoes off. I guess I'm the only one. Oh, through you too, Thelma. Thelma, I guess you and I, we're getting all the blessings today. My God, are you going to give God your shoe or not? Are you going to lay it at the altar and say, God, get in my shoes? Come on, do we have anybody hungry today? Says, God. When Boaz exchanged shoes, watch this. When Boaz exchanged shoes, it was the best thing that happened in over 10 years for them ladies. 10 years they were struggling. 10 years they were walking around, what are we going to do? 10 years they were wondering what was going to happen. 10 years in the corner of the field. And one exchange of shoe changed it all. Somebody shout glory. Telling you we need to give God our shoes. Once God gets in your shoes, your circumstances will change. Have you given God your shoe? Are you allowing him to get in your shoes? 
and give you land and legal authority to walk where you couldn't walk before? Giving God, how do I do that, Pastor? Giving God all the tithe of the increase is giving God the shoe. Walking by the Spirit and not by the flesh is giving God his, his shoe. Walking by faith and not by sight is giving God your shoe. Coming in on a Sunday morning when it's raining and getting your hands out of your pockets and lifting up your voice and raising your hands and singing a beautiful worship song to God is getting God in your shoes. Living a holy and righteous lifestyle before a holy God is getting God in your shoes. And when you give God a shoe, you pull a tack out. Praise God I had a shoe on. <laughs> That'd be nasty right there. Where's the trash can at? Somebody say, give God in your shoe. How many of you want God to give you what belongs to you? How many are believing God for breakthrough? How many have promises you're believing for? Listen, surrendering to God in every area of your life is giving God your shoe. General William Booth, the creator of Salvation Army, was once asked to reveal the secret of his success. And after some hesitation, tears came to his eyes. And here's what he said. General William Booth said it this way. I will tell you the secret. God has had all there was of me. There have been men with greater brains than I have, men with greater opportunities. But from the day that I got the poor of London on my heart and caught a vision of what Jesus could do with them, I made up my mind that God should have all of William Booth. I got a question for you today. There's a dying civilization out there. Are we willing to give God our shoe and say, God, you're going to have all of me? Even when it's not comfortable, even when I don't want to, I'm going to do it. The Lord put it on me to fast and pray. Three days, I thought, oh, man, I don't fast and pray Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The Lord told me, you get one meal a day. Okay, fine. So, man, I'm working. I'm irritable. I've got, man, just found out my truck engine went out. I got to go buy another car. I just, man, it did one thing after the other. I thought, oh, great. Now you want me to fast, too? I can't even eat and be miserable. So I started fasting. And I started praying Friday and Saturday and breaking away on my own. And I just said, God, I don't, man, I, you're going to have to do something. God, we got to see a breakthrough. God, there are souls. You didn't send us to Roosevelt Avenue to have a good, cute little service. And all of us church people just worship God together. But you sent us here to rent a harvest. You sent us here to change lives. Oh, God, you sent us here to see souls saved, lives transformed. And you know what I did? I, you know, I don't try to figure it out. I just said, okay, God, I'll do what you say. Here's my shoe. And I don't know where we're going. I don't know what we're going to do. But I know this. I'm going to give you my shoe, and we're going to take this land. It is not by mistake that God put us here. And I don't know about you, but I gave God my shoes. He's in my shoes. Brother Rob, come on, walk with me here. Look at He's in our shoes. Look at this. My blessed Lord. And we're going to walk where we've never walked before. We're going to see what God has. We've never seen God do before. We're going to see breakthrough. You're going to see mighty breakthrough in your life. Somebody shout glory. Hook your neighbor and say, get God in your shoes. Somebody say, give God your shoe. The man interviewed, interviewing him, Dr. Wilbur, Wilbur Chap Chapman said, I learned from William Booth in that interview that the greatness of man's power is the measure of his surrender. I'm going to preach the rest of this next week. I just feel this. Is there anybody out there that says, i got to give God my shoe? I got a doctor's report, and it's too big for me. So, God, I'm going to give you my shoes. Where'd my other shoe go? Where's my other shoe? Who's got my other shoe? Oh, I put it here. God, look, I done forgot where it was. Do you know what this represents? This represents me laying down my way, my way of fixing it, my strength, 
my ability, what I'm capable of, what I'm talented to do, what I can do, what I am in my own, that represents, it says, God, really the truth of the matter is I'm helpless. I'm like Moses. I can't even talk right. I stutter. I don't even know what to say. I don't know what to do. And God says, don't worry. When I get in your shoes, I'll part the Red Sea. I'll deliver you from Egypt. I'll send you to the promised land. All I need you to do is do what I say. Somebody shout glory. glory. Pastor, I got this problem. Everything I've tried, nothing's working out. It's time to lay your shoes at the altar. It's time. How many of you want to receive your promise? You've crossed over, but have you received? Blessed be thou of the Lord, O woman of God. <laughs> you have been attacked by giant after giant problem after problem and you have just seen the beginning of breakthrough you shall lay hands